what we call the Joint Council on Youth. And this is the uh, overall committee which is going to decide on everything we do, whether it's the priorities, what projects we run, how the money we're given is divided up. The young people involved in our committees who are elected every two years are on an equal footing with the governments. And it's a real equal footing because once we're allocated a budget to our department, then it's this committee who decides on uh, the rest. So that is one of the specificities of our area. There's a technical subcommittee which uh, looks after our um, uh, programme. Now, another uh, idea which is very important for us in the youth department is the fact that we are working with young people from all over Europe but we're particularly working with what we call multipliers. I guess this is jargon to the youth sector. And what we mean by multipliers is that we are working, our partners are generally the youth organizations throughout Europe or the local or regional governments or the national governments. But uh, we are going to be training and working with the young people who are members of these organizations and we're working with them to create a multiplying effect. So no matter who we work with, the idea is that the person comes and is trained by us or works with us for not only their own personal benefit, but also for the benefit of the youth organization or the young people that they're working with in the field. So the youth department is made up of a number of instruments. We've got the two European youth centers, Strasbourg and Budapest. Strasbourg was uh, created following a decision by the Parliamentary Assembly, which was called the Conference at that time in the 60s, when there was a lot of unrest in Europe uh, amongst young people. And there was a decision to ask the Council of Europe to create a, a safe place as such so that young Europeans could come and work together on the European values that we were promoting in the organization and to allow them work together on these and to participate fully. Participation is one of our biggest objectives, obviously, in the youth sector. So Strasbourg Youth Centre was built in 1972 after an experimental period of some years in Auberne, uh, out in the country. And at the same time, the European Youth Foundation was created. And this is a fund which, in monetary terms, is worth about 3 million euros a year. But it's a fund, it's not at all like the type of funding one might find in the European Commission. It's a small fund, but it particularly serves uh, for small local, regional and uh, national youth projects, which are going to allow uh, young, young people in youth organisations uh, build projects which go down the lines of our uh, priorities, which I'll mention afterwards. We run a partnership with the European Commission, which is quite unique in the Council of Europe, because first of all, we've been doing this for 15 years already, so it was quite innovative at the time. Uh, but it's a 50-50 partnership as well, which is uh, unlike many of our partnerships in the Council of Europe, are usually uh, mainly financed by the Commission and run by the Council. So in terms of financing, it might be 90-10 or 95-5. We have an equal footing there with the Commission and we're running research and uh, youth policy uh, programmes and activities in uh, the member states of the Council of Europe but also in the neighbouring regions, we're reaching out to them. We have a department which looks after intergovernmental cooperation so we're going to be able to advise uh, governments about their youth policy on their request. We don't go looking for uh, giving advice, uh, it's when they come to us. And we have a short, uh, small partial agreement on uh, youth mobility. So uh, there's a short uh, definition of how uh, the Committee of Ministers have defined youth policy in the Council of Europe. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to all young people. Uh, equal, equality of opportunities is obviously very important for us, and this is seen in our work because we're working very often with disadvantaged groups or minority groups uh, uh, throughout uh, Europe, and social inclusion 
is quite an important part of our programme. So how do we do all of this? I've mentioned the fact that we're working with multipliers. So this is very important for us, that the people we're working with, because we have a small department, we can't reach out to all the young Europeans. So what we do is we train the multipliers who they then go back and carry on uh, the good work. We're using a multicultural approach in most of our activities. So we very rarely would have an activity with 30 French people or 30 Belgian people. There, it's across the board. Most of our activities include 25 or 30 different nationalities. Um, we're serving countries who ask for us to carry out youth policy reviews. And we have a number of different partnerships through different activities and projects we're running. And I'll mention one project specifically later on. It's a campaign we're running at the moment. Uh, on hate speech online, which is reaching out to uh, most of our countries and indeed beyond the borders of Europe. And of course, the last thing which is important is we're working in non-formal education. So we're not handing out certificates or diplomas. We're working in what some of my colleagues call noisy education. You know, we get people to jump up and down before they start an activity and uh, uh, so that they, they're full of energy and things like that. And then we work on the, uh, it's really, a lot of it is doing, uh, learning by doing as well and working with each other. The type of activities we're running, and um, we use mainly our youth centres for most of our activities, uh, although we do run activities in member states and particularly in countries where we have specific bilateral uh, programmes. I'm thinking of the Russian Federation, Ukraine, uh, Turkey, where we have three specific youth bilateral programs and where we're trying to introduce, whether it be human rights education or conflict transformation, peace building, or uh, training of youth workers, depending on the, uh, the country. But we're running what are called study sessions in our centers. Uh, this is where we invite a youth organization, an international youth organization, to come and work on one of our themes. We cover all the expenses and they come with their international youth uh, uh, members and they work for eight days in our centre with the guidance of one of our educational team on the theme that they're dealing with, whether it be social inclusion or a question about refugees or we have across the board uh, themes that we're dealing with. We're running training courses and these training courses are adapted for youth leaders, but also sometimes from people from governments. We run a special 50-50 type training where we might have 50% of the participants are from the governmental side of a country and the other 50% are from youth organisations in order to bring them closer together in their country on a specific issue like human rights education. Um, and then we have seminars and consultative meetings uh, uh, to involve players, whether they be involved in youth work or youth research or youth policy. So this is the magic triangle that we're, we talk about. And of course, one uh, of the things we do quite a lot is we create educational uh, um, manuals and on the themes that we're dealing with. And these manuals are aimed at governments or youth authorities or youth organisations themselves. So very quickly, uh, a short look at our priorities for 2014 and 2015. And in retrospect, I think we're probably dealing with too many priorities. But uh, we are in this new programme and budget system in the Council of Europe where we're working now in a biennium system. And one of the advantages and disadvantages of working directly with the youth organisations is that they want you to deal with everything which is completely and utterly understandable because we're dealing with youth organisations from right across the board. We're not dealing just with political or religious or, or uh, scouts, or we're dealing with all types of youth organisations. So this is why we've quite a varied number of priorities. And the percentage you see there is how our uh, joint committee split up the... Um, the how we should spend the money for for this biennium so you'll see that it's uh, uh, human rights education obviously uh, is a big uh, project for us but we have a big roma youth action plan 
uh, were working for the first time on the question of transition from uh, the autonomy and transition to working life for young people. This is a new dossier for us. And of course, access to social rights and peace building I've mentioned. I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through all of these. These are, are what are called our expected results. They're all the different types of uh, things we're doing. Um, but we can come back to that if there are any specific uh, questions. You can just, these are just the different types of projects we're doing. Um, oops, now how do I get back to that? Okay, I don't know how to do that. The my IT days have been and gone, I'm afraid. Uh, the, the slide before this was on the European Youth Foundation, but I've already mentioned this, that uh, it's a fund which we... Oh, what do you need? Um, back. Call? Yeah, well, that, that's great. This one? Uh, yes, thank you. So um, the types of funding that they are going to give will be uh, uh, international youth meetings where they're going to allow... And the funds are not very big. A, a, a funding could be between seven and 15,000 euros, but very often it's a possibility for a local youth organization to set up a project which they never would have been able to do otherwise. So it's a, a different ball game than the type of funding we can get from other institutions, but it's something which uh, works very, very well on the, uh, on the ground for youth organizations. And uh, this is to get through the question of the empowerment. Uh, we are very much convinced that the best way to uh, empower young people, obviously, and uh, to make them participate in their own uh, everyday life and democracy is by uh, showcasing this co-management principle we have. Because uh, what's interesting to see is that when you put a group of 30 young people from completely different backgrounds and completely different youth organizations together with 47 member states, it creates very lively debates, um, not always consensus. And we are like the Committee of Ministers. Our committee works on the basis of consensus. Uh, but uh, it uh, certainly creates an awful lot of discussion on important issues which young people are living through day to day. And it's one of the reasons why we have so many priorities. But uh, again, we have to always try and focus better to um, get ahead on the... This is just uh, the way our structures are uh, formed. Uh, they're the different teams within the department. Uh, again, if you have any questions about that, we can come back to it later. And maybe I just wanted to take one example of a project we're running. I mentioned the Roma Youth Action Plan, which is a big project for us and which we, for which we also seek governmental funding because we, we don't have a huge budget. So this is uh, funded by a couple of member states, notably Belgium, who are uh, funding the Roma Youth Action Plan. We have another social inclusion project, which we call ENTER, which is also being funded by a number of member states. And this is working on projects for socially disadvantaged young people and uh, with the aim is to get them give them better knowledge on and access to social rights and this is a, a project we've been running for a few years and the ongoing project is an online youth campaign and uh, this uh, this project is fascinating for us because not only uh, i think we've come at the right time to discuss this issue which is hate speech online for young people, but the way the youth department in the Council of Europe runs its campaigns, I don't know if any of you ever heard of the All Different, All Equal campaign, which was run on two different occasions in 2006 and 1995, but uh, we run the campaign at the European level by giving institutional support, by giving educational resources. We've just published a manual, which is called Bookmarks, on uh, for educational people, on helping young people when they're confronted with the problem of hate speech. Uh, so we do the uh, general coordination at the European level and we ask each member state of the Council of Europe to set on up their own national campaign committees, usually done through the ministries of youth and sport, 
sometimes through justice, we've got some educational ministries. Today, we launched this campaign in March of 2013, and we have 38 member states who are involved in one way or another, many very actively in this campaign, which will run until next March. And it's um, when we run a campaign, it's sometimes frustrating for the people who are involved from the administrative side, i.e. the people who we have to respond to, the member states. Well, what's the impact on? So when I say, well, we've, we've, ha we've hit 10,000 Facebook uh, followers on our campaign site, or we had, I don't know how many, 200,000 tweets on such and such a co conference, this doesn't uh, make much sense for most of the people who are governing us. So uh, it's, it's always interesting to see how these campaigns take on a life of their own because basically we lose that we don't keep the control of how we're doing the campaign. But that's not what's of interest to us. What's of interest to us is that each member state is dealing with the question of hate speech online in the way which is appropriate for their member state. So in a country like Serbia, who are hugely active in the campaign, they're going to be running activities online and offline in a completely different way than, let's say, Finland, who's also very active, or Belgium, who's also very active, and they're just running things in a different way. And this is the joy of working with youth organisations as well, because they are all on the ground and they see what the issues are. Uh, for people, but I can give you more information on that afterwards if you want. And then just to final, there's just a link to our different uh, sites. Uh, one, as I said, I mentioned the question of participation. It is of fundamental importance to us to work on the question of participation, and we do this by working with the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities. We've developed manuals, we've developed charters on participation for young people. So all across the board of the Council of Europe, I can't say that youth is necessarily mainstreamed. It's our aim that it would be mainstreamed in the Council of Europe. But through campaigns like the No Hate Speech movement, we realize the interest shown by our colleagues from the other departments. And we also develop an interest ourselves in the work that the other departments are doing. And we see that we're doing valuable work on questions like hate speech or Roma work, uh, all of these which are priorities of the Secretary General. I'll stop there. I hope it wasn't too muddled because there's a lot to say and uh, of course we'd be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you.